Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. I have done this Sabbath school uh, once before, a uh, couple of years ago, actually, and I, I felt like I wanted to do it again, and I've been trying to find a week to put it in. So uh, as my research continues in Daniel chapter 11, I felt that this was uh, an appropriate time to go over famous last words. So today we're going to be looking at famous last words of the children of the world and then children of God and kind of look at their experiences and I think it'll be a great blessing. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, what an honor, what an immense honor it is that you call us sons and daughters. Most people think it's such an honor to speak before presidents, before congresses, before kings. But we have the privilege every morning, every day, every minute, to not only bow our heads, but to bend the knee and meet and commune with the king of creation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for the sacrifice, the condescension that you made on Calvary so that we could have a relationship restored with you again. We ask that your spirit, your ministering spirits would be here with us today as we study some history about famous last words of individuals. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Many times when people are on their deathbed, they kind of go over their lives. And it's very important as we study this to see what is the accumulation of that whole life experience that people have. That's what we're going to look at today with famous last words. So in Christianity, in Seventh-day Adventism, in a relationship with God, there is no middle ground. We cannot hold on to even one single minute sin, no matter what we think it is or how small we think it is. Amen. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So even folks, we have to understand that we really only have two decisions. That's it. We can choose to be a son or daughter of God. Or we can choose to be controlled by sin and by Satan and his demons. Amen. Not making a decision for either is making a decision for Lucifer. That's how it works. From uh, Bible Echo, November 20th, 1899. God will save no man while he continues in transgression after the light has come. The great sacrifice of the Son of God was made that it might be possible for man to become obedient through faith. That's a beautiful promise right there. That's our problem, folks. That's our, that's our big problem. We're disobedient. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus, it's possible. It's possible. Don't let anybody tell you it's not possible. It is possible for man to become obedient. Amen. How's that done? Faith. Through faith. Through faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The atonement and the offering of Christ for the sin of the world is the great argument that the law of God is binding upon every human being. Absolutely. If there's anything, I, I, I can't get away from it. Every time I share this, I always go back to when Mrs. White says that the, the death of the Son of God delivers the argument, I'm paraphrasing here, but delivers the argument in thunder tones, she says, that the law of God is binding upon all men. Amen. Otherwise, it would have just been swept away. There would have been some loophole. There would have been some way around it. But no, Christ came here to fulfill the claims of the law. Why? Because they're binding upon everyone, including God. Amen. 
I came not, said Christ, to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. For, ev for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The everlasting inheritance is purchased only for the elect. It's a work that we all have to do, and it's a daily, minute by minute, second by second thing that we have to work for. The choices we make in life, they echo in eternity. While God has given ample evidence for faith, he will never remove all excuse for unbelief. If you are seeking for a reason not to follow God, you will find it. You'll find it. He, because, and why, why does he do that? Does anyone have an answer? Why doesn't God remove all doubt? Why doesn't, why doesn't he just part the clouds and say, I'm here, I, I exist, my law is binding, and you need to follow it. Why doesn't he do that? What free will would there be if he did that? See, he allows the bit of doubt. Can you bring the mic to uh, Paul back there? He allows the doubt to exist because then that allows us to make a choice. We can choose to, to look at the evidence which clearly shows that there is a God, that he exists, that he has a law, that he loves us. Or we can nitpick and find every little possible reason not to follow him, and we can find that too. The choice is ours. Paul? A big issue with what you're talking about was after 1844. William Miller never kept the Sabbath, and many people that were in that movement never kept the Sabbath. And this was, to this day, in Adventism is an issue because we're told they're going to be in heaven. Well, they never kept the Sabbath, they're going to be in heaven. Well, it's exactly the point. They lived up to all the light they had. Amen. At that time, the Sabbath was not revealed for what it was or what it is to be. And those people that lived up to that light, even though they never kept the Sabbath, will have eternal life. And we're told that as... They, we go to heaven, we're going to stop and keep a Sabbath. It will be the first one they kept, and they will weep uh, 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 vigorously, if you will, because Amen. of it. However, after, what was it, October or September of 1844, that no longer was the case because that light was shed, and anybody that came up to that point and then, well, I'm going to stay, keep Sunday, even though they lived the perfect life, if you will, will not have eternal life because that one point. Right. If they had the light and rejected it, that's it. Or, or you're, you're, even repeat, you're or, basically repeating this right here. Or won't even accept the new light. Right. So we have that situation today. Because as the, this situation is unfolding in our time, Prophecies are becoming clear, and our duty is becoming clear, and the vast majority of Seventh-day Adventists are not wanting to do their duty. They will lose eternal life with their money and with their time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's coming a time where even the Sabbath will be rejected by those who have kept it in the past. But Paul's saying in the same sense of what Bible Echo said, God will save no man while he continues in transgression after the light has come. When the light comes, we have a decision to make. Going on with the quote from uh, Great Controversy, page uh, 527, it says, all, all who look for hooks to hang their doubts upon will find them. And those who refuse to accept and obey God's word until every objection has been removed. I've met people like this. And there is no longer an opportunity for doubt will never come to the light. This is, this is the situation for a lot of folks in the world. So, without further ado, let's take a look at some, some of the uh, men of renown, if you will, of the world and their, their last words. Essentially, before we go there, essentially, this is our choice. We can choose the humble, meek Jesus, or we can choose the tyrant, Lucifer, and not making a choice is making a choice. There is no 
oh, I'm just going to do it my own way. Your own way is Satan's way. So, from uh, Gandhi, uh, The Wit and Wisdom of Gandhi, page 186. He talks about the Sermon on the Mount here. He says, I love Hinduism more dearly than life itself. And I'm not trying to pick on these people and their religion. I want to point that out. I'm simply asking the question, does the path that they chose, does it lead to peaceful rest? Does it? That's the question we're asking. So, I love Hinduism more dearly than life itself. I must tell you in all humility that Hinduism, as I know it, entirely satisfies my soul. We're going to test that. Fills my whole being, and I find a solace in the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, that's their sacred writings, that I miss even in the Sermon on the Mount. Not that I do not prize the ideal presented therein. Not that some of the precious teachings in the Sermon on the Mount have not left a deep impression upon me. But I must confess to you that when doubt haunts me, when disappointments stare me in the face, and when I see not one ray of light in the horizon, I turn to the Bhagavad Gita and a verse to comfort me. My life has been full of external tragedies, and if they have not left any visible and delible effect on me, I owe it to the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. Well, it wasn't an everlasting peace, which he spoke of in the last verse. From uh, Give Me an Answer, Cliff uh, Netchel, page 20, his book, Towards the end of his life, Gandhi is known to have said these words. My days are numbered. I am not likely to live very long, perhaps a year or a little more. For the first time in 50 years, I find myself in a slew of despond. And all about me is darkness. I am praying for light. So, the Sermon on the Mount, which he rejected, and the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, their sacred writings in Hinduism, they left Gandhi in darkness at the end of his life. Let's go on to another one. Socrates. All of the wisdom of this world is but a tiny raft upon which we must set sail when we leave this earth. If only there was a firmer foundation upon which to sail, perhaps some divine word. Wow. Wow. Coming from him, it's quoted in Kenneth Boa, Rewriting Your Broken Story, The Power of the Eternal Perspective, Chapter 5 in the Conclusion section. So even Sock philosophy didn't fulfill him, did it? He wished that there was a firmer foundation. Is there a firmer foundation, folks? What is, what is that firmer foundation? This book right here. Who wrote this book? The Lord. And the writers he chose, did he choose kings only? Generals only? They're in there. They're writers. Who else did he choose? Peasants. Farmers. <laughs> Some of them, we don't know exactly who the writers are. Chronicles and kings, we don't know necessarily who they are. Historians? Murderers. This is an amazing book. This is a firm foundation which Socrates hoped for, probably had an opportunity for at some point. But his philosophy didn't fulfill him. It didn't, it didn't fulfill his eternal being. Bill, go ahead. Cody, when Socrates said that, there was in existence yes. a divine word. And it was the Old Testament. It was Absolutely. the Greek Septuagint. And the fact that he could say such a thing would, you know, that, that would lead me to say, well, where were the people of God spreading the truth? Amen. Where were they? Because here, obviously, was a man who had never had access 
to somebody giving him a leaflet, a flyer, a tract, a book that would show him there was a divine word. Absolutely. Because there was. You're right. There was at that time. Absolutely. There has been since Mount Sinai. Now, looking at psychology, okay? Sigmund Freud, on his deathbed, he said this, from the man in the mirror solving 24 problems men face by Patrick Morley, chapter 24, entitled Famous Last Words. The meager, meager satisfaction that man can extract from reality leaves him starving. That's somebody who, if, you, if you've looked into Sigmund Freud, who openly rejected God, who thought that everything in psychology basically had to do with what happened when you were a child and sexual things. That's basically what his whole psychology was based off of. And they call him a pioneer and a great mind. Did it fulfill him? His own words, folks, his own words left him starving. How about Napoleon? Who did Napoleon work for? The Jesuit order. Trained in Corsica to be the boogeyman and to be the, the whipping belt on the Catholic countries who had rejected the Jesuit order and eventually the Pope himself. He was their man. He was, he was the sword, folks. Quoted from the same, same source. He's noted for saying this on his deathbed. I die before my time, and my body shall be given back to the earth and devoured by worms. What an abysmal gulf between my deep miseries and the eternal kingdom of Christ. I marvel that whereas the ambitions, ambitious dreams of myself and of Alexander and of Caesar should have vanished into thin air, a Judean peasant, Jesus, should be able to stretch his hands across the centuries and control the destinies of men and nations. He's jealous. Did his war escapades, did they fulfill him? No. No. An abysmal gulf. And why does this happen? I don't think God's picking on these people at the, at, in, their, in their last days. But his spirit is removed from them. And the, when, when God's spirit, God is light. When he's removed from you, there's only darkness around you. And when they see that the, the time, the clock, it's about to tick its last tick, they have this realization that they are in darkness. And finally, you get a bit of truth come out from their mouths. To summarize the experience of their life choices, Napoleon's, I wouldn't... I wouldn't give anything to be in that man's shoes. I do not envy his amazing war tactic genius or any of the choices he made because this is where it ends. This is where it ended for Napoleon. He was banished in the uh, island, British Isle of uh, St. Helena, and that's where he died. Now. An obey, obedient king to, at the height of papal supremacy from uh, the Evidence Bible, Irrefutable Evidence for the Thinking Mind, page 582. King Philip III of France reigned in 1270 to 1285. He was obedient to the Roman Catholic Church's will, coronated by Pope Innocent IV. He generally followed the consciences of his counselors and participated in the Eighth Crusade. Said this on his deathbed. What an account I shall have to give to God. How I should like to live otherwise than I have lived. Most people, they want to be kings and queens. They envy these people their entire lives. But where did it end? How did it end for him? He was, a, he was basically a puppet of the Catholic Church. He should have 
you know, he should have been good in God's eyes, right? But his obedience to the Catholic Church put him at odds with God. And he wished that he could have that time back. That way he could choose a different path. King Charles, uh, King Charles the Ninth, from the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, same King Charles, from 1550 to 1574. He was the King of France. Uh, sorry, this is quoted from last and near last words of famous, infamous, and those in between from Joseph W. Lewis, Jr. It's written uh, like, a, like a dictionary. So you just simply look up the heading, Charles the Ninth, subsection. Charles the Ninth. He was the king of France. Under an oath of safety, a group of French Protestants was allowed into Paris to attend the wedding of the king of Navarre. Charles's mother, Catherine de' Medici, urged him to order the slaughter of thousands of these Protestants, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Apparently, this act greatly troubled the dying monarch because he lamented to his medical attendants. Listen to this. Listen to this, this decision that he made. Asleep or awake... I see the mangled forms of the Huguenots passing before me. They drip with blood. They point at their open wounds. Oh, that I had spared at least the little infants at the breast. What blood? I know not where I am. How will all of this end? What shall I do? I am lost forever. I know it. Oh, I have done wrong. God pardon me. His decision to slaughter the Protestants and their children haunted him for the rest of his life. And when the end was near, and this is just a theory that I have personally, and I, I, think, um, I think the dark forces really set around people in the end and antagonize them that they're going to go to the lake of fire. I, I think that they do. And it seemed like, uh, Paul's got something, Bill. It seemed like this man who chose to do the will of the Catholic Church and slaughter people, that he was, he was totally tortured soul on his dying bed. Paul? You know, the amazing thing of that act, um, the, Eng there was English royalty there or parts of the English court who were, in, were there. It was Protestant, I can't remember the man's name. He became very close to Elizabeth because he was, let, he was taken out of the country under escort and he became, for lack of the term they had then, head of what you would call the CIA or secrets. Walshingheim. Yes, uh, Walshingheim. and because Walshingheim. of that single act that he witnessed and these, what was 50 to 70,000 that were slaughtered did not die in vain. Mary, Queen of Scots, did not ascend the throne of England, who was a puppet of Rome. Because of that act, that man, Wolfingham, was there. He saw it, and he foiled her, and he had her executed before she could take over in England. So by him allowing that act to happen, he kept the pope out of England and taking over that country. Helped which, Protestantism flourish. Yes, and, yes. which foiled Spain and foiled France in the Pope's desires. So these people did not die in vain Amen. because he witnessed that and he said, no way will Rome ever, as long as I'm alive, take over Protestantism in England. Amen. Thank you for pointing that out, Paul, because while these people are making this decision and they're tortured with this decision for the rest of their lives, on the other hand, you're asking, why did these other people die? Well, God turns the devil's best work against him. Yes. And this is perfect proof positive what that Paul act, just man, said. That single act, he said himself, yes. they will never Amen. set foot on English soil. And he started stomping out all the nobles, you know, yes. that were Roman Catholic. He got them out or he had them executed. Amen. Amen. He got them out. He got the Roman Catholic disease out of England. And even the Huguenots, the Huguenots themselves, what did they do after this? The survivors, they left, they went, they scattered across the entire world, and they set up settlements with the true religion of God there. Amen. 
and the seed, the good seed, was planted throughout the world. So God takes the devil's best work, turns it against him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, let's look at Voltaire. This is, we were looking at some of this stuff last week in a different, in a, in a different setting, not Voltaire specifically, but, but really communism, the king of the south, and the stuff that happened in France, the atheism that took over France, uh, you know, going really as part of it as a direct reflection of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. The, the rejection of Protestantism, the embracing of Roman Catholicism, eventually led to atheism in France. And Voltaire was their patron saint, if you will. <laughs> he said this, In 20 years Christianity will be no more. My single hand shall destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. Voted, uh, quoted in the Pacific, volume 51, page 22. Didn't like Christianity very much. In fact, these are, this is the Declaration of Human Rights. How is it... How is it uh, look to you? What does it remind you of? Ten Commandments. Why does it do that? Because he's spitting in God's face. He's saying, these are our commandments. We reject yours. Voltaire, he was one of the great minds, great minds, if you will, of that time that helped foster, and they call this the Enlightenment, which is sad. The historian Peter Garr himself, an admirer of Voltaire, described Voltaire's distaste for Christianity as almost an obsession. Repeated and passionately, Voltaire returned to the th Every sensible man, every honorable man, must hold the Christian sect in horror. Quoted from The Roads to Modernity, uh, Gertrude Himmel Himmelfarb, page 154. Go ahead, Bill. Cody, the, the Christianity that Voltaire spent his life trying to destroy was Roman Catholic Christianity. Yes, that's, that's an interesting point. And that's what he hated. And that's why he called it, he held it in horror because of the principles of truth, but he saw them being trampled upon by those professing to be followers of God. So that's why it's so important for us that if we say, if we take the name Christian, that we follow it, that we are on our knees every day asking that God's spirit would be in us, that way we could be his actual representatives and not false representatives. Amen. Well, let's see how this turned out. From a collection of 100 pieces of English literature, uh, by B.S. Naylor, page 181. He says, I am abandoned by God and man. Doctor, I will give you half of what I am worth if you will give me six months' life. The doctor answered, Sir, you cannot live six weeks. Voltaire replied, Then I shall go to hell, and you will go with me. It's sad, because as Bill brought out, perhaps Voltaire's story could have been different. If a true Christianity was represented to him. And this happens with so many people, we have to understand. So many people look at what the church or church is or people within the church are doing and they see the hypocrisy of it and they run the other way 100 miles an hour and they say, I want nothing to do with that God or those people. And unfortunately, because we misrepresent him. And they're responsible for that at the end of the day because they're making that connection. They're allowing uh, God's so-called servants, professed servants, and rejecting God. That's on them, but it's on us too. When we misrepresent him and we cause a distasteful taste in the mouths of others where they want nothing to do with the true religion of Christ. Paul and then Jesse. The important thing, too, as Bill pointed out, these people were uh, uh, destroyed by Roman Catholicism, not by true Christianity. And the amazing thing about this man's statement, about three and a half years after he made that statement, it took 12 men to dispel the gospel, but one man destroyed it after they burned their Bibles. That same council mm. 
said, no, no, we need Christianity back because it's ruined France, which to this day has never recovered from that. To this day, France has not recovered from that uh, uh, burning the Bibles and destroying Christianity. Yes, there absolutely. Jesse? Uh, I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to talk to you afterwards, but you, you made a statement that prompted me to go ahead and say it now. Last week, I met a man that said his father was a pastor, a man of the Bible. I can't remember what, what uh, religion, but I don't, know what, I don't know. I can't remember. But he said he read up on and actually decided the Sabbath was the day that should be worshipped on. Amen. So he went to the church, and when he came back, he told them that may be God's church, but it's not God's people that was there in the church. And what he did, he started uh, worshipping at home, and he kept the Sabbath, uh, what the man told me, even though he did go from 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock, he kept the Sabbath every week, and those the kids that wasn't there, they was held responsible for not uh, being uh, at home at the beginning of the Sabbath. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. That's why, I mean, that's, that, that's echoing to me Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, where it says, Come out of her, my people. There are people. And that's why it's so important that we do this work, because there... God's people are everywhere. They're among the unbelievers. They're among the different denominations. They're among the other religions sometimes. They don't know it yet. Amen. We have to find them and present the truth to them. Another Enlightenment thinker, so-called Enlightenment, a book called Make Disciples by Terry Bolin, page 221. This is from Thomas Paine. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Thomas Paine. I would give worlds if I had them. The Age of Reason had never been published. O oh Lord, help me. Christ, help me. O oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? But there is no God. But if there should be, what will become hereafter? Stay with me, for God's sake. Send even a child to stay with me, for it is hell to be alone. If ever the devil had agent... I have been that one. Did his decisions, writing the age of reason, being a, a bulwark against, against the faith, did that bode well for him in the end? Did that fulfill him in the end? No. Let's look at Anton LaVey from Satanism. He said this in the Satan... Go ahead, go ahead, Paul, first. Go ahead. Real quick. I was, Rita and I were given a quarterly. It was a few years back from the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. It was their regular conference quarterly. It had quotes in it from Thomas Paine. Mrs. Yes. White says yes. one of the most foul men to ever set foot on the earth. So where are we going? Where, they won't put Ellen White's quotes in there. They put the little easy ones but they're using Thomas Paine. Where are we going? Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. So Anton LaVey, leader of the Satanic Church, wrote in the Satanic Bible, page, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. It's blasphemously uh, written like the Bible is. It says, I dip my forefinger in the watery blood of your impotent and mad redeemer and right over his thorn-torn brow, the true prince of evil, the king of slaves. That's what he said about Jesus. How did that turn out for him? Well, from The Only Solution, David Hackathorn, page 63, it says, On his deathbed, Anton LaVey has a revelation of the spiritual world just as he is about to die. And he uttered his last words, and these are his last words from the quote, What have I done? There's something very wrong here. 
This is all wrong. And then he died. Did he have peace? Doesn't seem to be. Something seemed to be terribly wrong in his mind and in his heart on his deathbed. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Because Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22, has the promise that there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Those who choose those paths willingly, there's no peace there. There's no peace at the end of that road. There's no fulfillment at the end of that road. Now, occultist Aleister Crowley, he said this uh, in his book, The World's Tragedy, page 39. I do not wish to argue that the doctrines of Jesus, they and they alone, have degraded the world to its present condition. Wow, what a statement. Because the exact opposite is actually true. The, the rise of Western civilization is a, direct, is a direct product of the Protestant Reformation. The degradation of society, go back to the Middle Ages, comes from Roman Catholicism. Continues, I take it that Christianity is not only the cause, but the symptom of slavery. Well, on December 1st, 1947, Aleister Crowley died. I am perplexed, were reported as his dying words. I am perplexed. Not I know where I'm going. Guys, I've reached the, the goal. I'm about to ascend to the next realm or whatever. I'm perplexed. Or his last words. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. It says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Amen. See, if, he had a, if he'd have chosen to have the possibility of becoming obedient through faith to the law of God, he may have had a different set of last words. Now, lastly, and then we're going to look at the other side of this coin. Roman Catholicism's greatest champion. Who's this? Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola. From History of the Jesuits, Volume 1, page 292. Let's see how all his scheming all his setting up of institutional education system, his, his assassination plots and the, the things that he created in the Jesuit order, the structure, let's see if that gave him eternal rest and fulfillment. He said this, I have done much good to the Church of Rome. I have seen many provinces of our men, many colleges, houses, residents, and wealth belonging to our society. But all these things desert me now, and I don't know where to turn. At length, he expired in a fit of trembling, and his face turned black, according to an eyewitness, a Jesuit Tyrannus. He died trembling with his face turned black, questioning every decision he had ever made to help Rome. Did he have fulfillment? Now, keep all of these men and their, their greatness in the world's eyes. Keep that in mind as you read this one. Martin Luther, quoted in the autobiography of Martin Luther, John Parker Lawson, page 362 and 363. This is what Martin Luther said on his dying bed. You might find it a little different. O oh my Father, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all consolation, I thank Thee for having revealed to me Thy well-beloved Son, in whom I believe, whom I have preached and acknowledged, loved and celebrated, and whom the Pope and the impious persecute. I commend to thee my soul, Jesus my Lord. I am quitting this earthly body. I am leaving this life. But I know I shall abide with thee for eternity. He then repeated three times the words of the psalm, Into thy hands I commit my spirit, God of truth. Thou hast redeemed me. Which story do you want? <laughs> now, was this an easy life that led to this point? No. No, it wasn't. 
But he found a way to be obedient to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he loved Jesus, and he had him as a friend, and he had him as a savior. And on his dying bed, he wasn't confused. His face didn't turn black. He wasn't fearful of the, of the coming judgment. He was at peace because he had a savior in whose life he had put his trust in. The summary of the experience of the path he chose in his, his life is something that I think we all would dream to have on our dying bed. <laughs> the author, John Bunyan, from the book Make Disciples, again, page 221. Weep not for me, but for yourselves. I go to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, through the mediation of his blessed Son, receive me, though a sinner, where I hope we shall meet to sing the new song and remain everlastingly happy, world without end. Amen. Amen. It's that faith in Christ and overcoming sin and trusting in God and keeping Him as a friend and day by day begging Him for strength that gave these folks the power from on high to willingly and gladly sacrifice themselves to the beasts of Rome to sing hymns as they were lighted as torches in the Colosseum. And they're the victors, folks. They're the winners of this battle. Though it doesn't appear that way here in this earth, these folks are the victors, and it's because they place their trust in Christ. Paul? You know, when you read about the martyrs, how they went to the stake and the statements they made and the joy, they were singing hymns. I honestly believe that men like Loyola, uh, Voltaire, etc., cetera, uh, Crawley, who's responsible for modern Satanism and the satanic strip scriptures who he inspired LaVey, uh, when they die, I think the Lord brings to mind oh, absolutely. exactly what they've done and exactly where they're going. And the interesting contrast, Martin Luther lived a life of a fugitive. He had to fear for his life. Many Huss, all these guys, Wycliffe, they lived a meager existence, but they will be rich, re, richly rewarded. These other guys, they lived in luxury, that everything the earth could give. But in death, they knew that, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They felt that pain that Jesus felt on the cross from the unsaved. And right. I don't think we can even understand what that oh, is. Oh, no, I don't think we could either, because the spirit was completely withdrawn from them, and that's something that they don't think they ever truly fully felt, probably most of their lives, but on their deathbed they understood, this is the decision you've made. Patrick Henry. He said this on his dying bed, very interesting statement, uh, from America's God and Country Encyclopedia of Quotations, page 290. Doctor, I wish you to observe how real and beneficial the religion of Christ is to man about to die. In his will, he stated, this is all the inheritance I give to my, fam my dear family. The religion of Christ will, I give them, will give them one which will make them rich indeed. Amen. I mean, he's, he's on his deathbed, and he's telling the doctor, he says, he says, Doctor, I wish you to observe how real and beneficial the religion of Christ is to a man about to die. I am at peace. Amen. John Newton, the singer, Amazing Grace, from the Christian Advocate, Volume 80, March 2nd, 1905, page 336. He said, I am still in the land of the dying. I shall be in the land of the living soon. Amen. And his next thought, his next conscious thought, will be Christ coming in the clouds, raising him to life with a new body 
to the eternal riches and glory of his new home with Jesus. That's what, that's his next, that chapter ended with his death, his next chapter. That's the first beginnings of his, that's the first paragraph of his next chapter. What's the first paragraph of Anton LaVey's? Or Napoleon's? Or Gandhi's? Which one do you want? Now, John Wesley. This one's a little bit long, but it's worth it, folks. Uh, from a biography, Stephen, Stephen Tompkins, page 193 and 194. On Tuesday, the 1st of March, he called for pen and ink, but could not write. His devoted uh, band leader, Betsy Ritchie, said, Let me write for you, sir. I, tell me what you want to say. Nothing, answered Wesley, but that God is with us. He then astonished his attendants by bursting out with the last hymn he had led at the city road a week before. I'll praise my maker while I've breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise shall never be passed, while life and thought being last or immor immortality endures. He urged that his sermon on the love of God be printed and given away for free. But then his mumbling became incomprehensible. So he merely repeated at intervals, the best of all, God is with us. Throughout the night, he tried to sing the same hymn, but could only get out, I'll praise, I'll praise. After a last farewell, he died on Wednesday morning. You know John Wesley died penniless? Did you know that? Yes. He's supposed to have ridden somewhere around 290,000 miles on horseback with his revivals and camp meetings, really is what they were, um, throughout uh, the revival period of England. And everything that his church gained, he always gave it out back to the work. And this man did not build himself an empire and die and give his children a bunch of... He died penniless. Gave it all to the cause. And he, he said, <laughs> the best of all, God is with us on his dying bed. Lastly, the prophet, Ellen White. She's noted for saying this from Life Sketches of Ellen G. White, page 449. I know in whom I have believed. God is love. He giveth his beloved sleep. A peaceful, calm, fulfilled death. The final words of individuals, these are my words. Um, the final words of individuals may, many times reveals a summary of their past, present, and future condition. Their remarks are highly telling of their experiences here on earth. May our final condition be of solemn rest and peace with our maker, like these individuals here. Not the first part, but the second part. Amen. But that can't be done, folks. That cannot be done. If we are expecting God to do all the work, there is something for us to put in as well. And it's very important that we understand that only a total separation from the world will be the, the lowly, cheap offering that we can give back to God for eternal life and eternal bliss and eternal friendship with Him. This is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 339. You might today be men of honor and of trust, but you have all, all been so well satisfied with yourselves that you have not improved the light and privileges which have been graciously granted you. Your minds have not been expanded by the Christian graces, neither have your affections been sanctified by communion with the life giver. 
There is a littleness, an earthliness, which stamps the outer character and reveals the fact beyond doubt that you have been walking in the way of your own heart and in the sight of your own eyes, and that you are filled with your own devices. When connected with God and sincerely seeking His approval, man becomes elevated, ennobled, and sanctified. The work of elevation is one that man must perform for himself through Jesus Christ. Heaven may give him every advantage as so far as temporal and spiritual things are concerned, but it is all in vain unless he is willing to appropriate these blessings and to help himself. His own powers must be put to use, or he will finally be weighed in the balances and pronounced wanting. He will be a failure so far as this life is concerned and will lose the future life. Martin Luther put in that work. Ellen White put in that work. The martyrs that have died throughout the centuries singing hymns as they were lighted for the Colosseum and fed to lions, they put in that work. John Bunyan put in that work. John Newton put in that work. Only a total separation from the world, folks, an entire sacrifice, can we win the eternal prize. So let us run the race that our dying words might be similar to these folks. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the historical account of the, the dying words of different individuals because it gives us an idea of where those principles, where that path that they have chosen, where it leads. And Lord, we, we want to be on the good path, the narrow way, the old paths, Lord, that you speak of in Jeremiah chapter 6. We want to be with you in eternity. We ask, Lord, that if we have any idols that we are unaware of, that you would make us aware of them and that we would lay those idols, Lord, at your feet and just allow you and your spirit to be ruling on the throne of our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for not abandoning us. Thank you for being so patient with us. We ask that you help us to continue through the process of sanctification that one day we might be glorified in you. In Jesus' name, amen.